Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the panel two on the second day of the CG annual conference. My name is Lily Yang from the University of Hong Kong. In this panel, we will have three speakers sharing the research focusing on the public character of tertiary education. All of the three speakers are in different ways connected with the CG Project 8, which is on local and global public good of higher education. The three speakers are Dr. Aline Kotuas, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Education at the University of Bath, and Dr. Elisa Bruis, who is a research associate at CG and is currently working on the Project 8 on the public and local um, local and global public good of higher education. And Dr. Christian Zagowski, who is a researcher um, at the Scholarly Communication Research Group of Adam um, Mikiewicz University in Poland. Each of the speakers will speak for around roughly 10 to 12 minutes. And there are a few more housekeeping issues that I'd like to um, share before we get started. Um, please be reminded that the conference, including this panel, is being recorded. And um, you, uh, please keep your mic off during session unless you are going to ask questions and are invited to do so. So during the question Q&A uh, session time, you are invited to indicate that you want to ask a question by sending a message in the chat box. And then I will invite you um, to turn on your mic and camera and ask your question. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Aline first um, to share your research. The floor is yours, Aline. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so here are the slides. Hope you can all see them. Yes. Okay, great. So thank you very much for uh, the invitation to speak today. I'm really delighted for this opportunity to catch up with colleagues, even if it's uh, only virtual for now, and also to continue these important conversations about higher education and the public good. So um, I will present findings from the French case from these two projects, so 1.1 uh, and 1.2, local and global public good contributions of higher education in six national systems and internationalization of higher education as a public good uh, for national systems. So these projects uh, started in 2016 when I was myself at CGHE and have since expanded, expanded and included a lot more countries now, so which is great to, to hear. And, uh, and to follow. So I uh, will uh, present findings from uh, the research conducted then, and I will draw mainly on a paper that has been co-authored with Vincent Carpentier and was published in, uh, in Compare last year. And I'll add some, some further reflections. I also draw on some material that I've been developing with Vincent, uh, more specifically about um, internationalization and what it means about the, the public good in France. So, uh, so this is a bit of a kind of very simplistic, uh, crude comparison, if you like, but this, I think, is useful to think about higher education and the various debates around the public good and the uh, private good. So um, the French higher education system is quite interesting to look at, I think, from a British perspective, especially if we think of the principles that underpin it. So it's very different in a number of ways. Um, traditionally, it's had very low fees. It can almost be considered as free. So we're talking about a few hundred euros that cover health insurance as well. And that's for all levels of education with only a slight increase for a doctoral level, for example. Uh, there's there has been also in place a system of means tested bursaries for families of low means. So you can get up to six, a bit more than 6,000 uh, euros a year in support from the state to attend higher education. Um, there's also like, you know, subsidies for student housing, for meals on campus, etc. cetera. Uh, up until very recently, there were no additional costs for international students. So what was available for um, French citizens was available for others. No selection because university access is considered a right. So that has also changed in the last few years. Uh, when I say no selection, that's for universities. And maybe it's a good time to just explain briefly that in France, 
higher education is more than just universities. Universities uh, have been absorbing, absorbing the bulk of massification. And you also have a very selective segment of higher education uh, where entry um, is, is selective. But for universities, it's not selective, it's considered a right, or that was the case until recently. And also research traditionally has relied on both project-based funding and also direct funding of labs, so situations where uh, researchers can go to the head of lab and explain what they want to do and, you know, they get the money and the time to, to do it. That's the way uh, it was, and there's still a little bit of that, but that is, that is, um, that is changing. So you can see from that that there are different IDs basically uh, underpinning both systems. The UK values uh, higher education as a private good, as something that you will invest in personally through loans, for example, and international students have to pay a higher price as well for it. And it's a selective system and it's very different. Why higher education kind of link in France is very much linked to the idea of the public good and public service, as I will explain shortly. So recent reforms, and they're interesting because they kind of frame as well uh, our findings very much so. So things have been changing. Parcoursup was introduced in uh, 2018, and it's a platform. It's a, a platform through which students have to submit their university or course choices. And then uh, their applications are sent to universities and there is now a selection of their applications. And there has been a lot of pushback. Uh, there has been pushback in the form in, in some instances of sabotage. So university staff refusing to implement uh, selection criteria, accepting all applications and that kind of thing. And a lot of debate because uh, for a lot of people, it goes really against the idea of you know, education, access to higher education as a right, and there should be no selection. So that goes completely against that, but it's in place now. Uh, Bienvenue en France, so the other one that's, um, that's about international students and changing the rules of access and implementing uh, cost sharing for international students. Um, so that came in in 2020. Again, a lot of resistance against it. A lot of um, different actions from student groups, from uh, migrant groups as well, migrant rights groups are arguing that it was discrimination because all of a sudden, all of a sudden, international students were asked to pay about 10 times what they used to pay for higher education in France. So a lot of resistance, but that is also um, in place now. Um, other things that happened recently, so universities have been grouped together to create bigger universities so that they could compete in international rankings, so that is new. And the more recent law that has been implemented um, um, three years ago is actually for pushing this, the system further towards competition between universities and project-based funding. Um, the funding for private research has been renewed and increased as well, again, another controversy. The tenure system has been altered a little bit to make space for short term or tenure track positions instead of tenure. And again, a lot of opposition. So in a way, all those reforms are framed as reforms that modernize the system and move it from an underfunded system, open but underfunded, to something that can be marketed abroad. So the first picture you see is from a site called uh, Universi Université en Ruine, so uh, University in Ruins, that is uh, that documents the underfunding of universities. And the other one is a promotional picture from Campus France, which kind of promotes French higher education abroad. So what does it mean for the public good? Uh, in the, so the conversations we had with university leaders and managers and staff, teaching and research staff, back in uh, 2017 and 2018 were very interesting to understand how people who work in the sector position themselves in relation to those reforms. So that was five years ago. So it's when all those reforms were brewing, okay? And also what differentiated our approach is that really we interviewed a wide range of uh, people across different positions and across the ideological spectrum, if you like, because a lot of studies document resistance 
and how people that are unhappy, but we also had people who were actually quite happy with the uh, the reforms that were that were uh, being prepared. Um, interestingly, public good is not. We ask questions about the public good, but it's not really a concept that interviewees picked upon for the most part. They prefer to replace it with intérêt général, general interest, and public service because public goods they were not comfortable with that concept for, for various reasons, including uh, the reforms and the way things had changed in the view. And really, uh, it was deeply connected for most of them to ideas of social justice, uh, self-realization through education, shared resources and benefits with the idea that state services or state agents, public servants are better able to provide teaching and research for the general interest. So that very simple diagram here um, kind of tries to show how those things are connected in the discourse. So public funding for many was the condition to ensure a public service. In public service, the only way through which the production of truly public knowledge could be could happen. And also the best way also to provide free access, equality, diversity, citizenship and the common good. So with the underlying idea that privatization, most forms of privatization would disrupt this link and make things not work in a good way. So that's kind of uh, the uh, public good chain uh, view of higher education. Uh, now, of course, it was not as simple because all those reforms and changes were discussed. So what came out, and this is really like a very broad summary slide to finish, a very strong attachment to values of public service that really came through all the interviews we did, but also many acknowledged that there were competing values and that they were gaining ground and from different angles as well. So chronic underfunding and understaffing that has been affecting the system for a long time and also reforms that were viewed very much as um, reforms aimed at increasing marketization, competition between institutions, and those were also a threat to the public service uh, role of higher education in the view of many of um, our interviewees. Of course, this varied. So as I said, you had opponents and you had uh, people who were quite, who saw those reforms as the, as the only way forward, very much so. But you also had, interestingly, a discourse that emerged that was an attempt to reconcile both and to say, well, okay, it's not the public good or the public service as we knew it. It's something different, but it's still very much there. So among those um, more ambiguous or hybrid discourses, the idea of employability was very much central in that. So and you could see differences between those that saw this concept as an obstacle to the realization of the public good, but others who were saying, well, actually it is a public good and maybe we have to move in that direction. And also very much so again, in a context of underfunding, uh, the idea that maybe if you somehow diminish the public good, if you enclose it a little bit, if you move a little bit towards some form of cost sharing, uh, you could save this public good in a way rather than completely uh, destroy it. And interestingly, when we talked about internationalization and mobility, we had that idea kind of uh, emerging that, well, you know, maybe we could enclose it and keep it for French nationals, maybe European um, uh, students and European researchers. And uh, that would be a way to kind of, you know, uh, keep it alive. So, yes, so just really to, to conclude, uh, different view of the public good from the UK perhaps, but uh, a move towards something that's a little bit closer to the Anglo-Saxon model maybe in the future, but it's really interesting to see how those reforms and those shifts really bring to light the centrality of that idea of public service in higher education. And I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you very much, Aline, um, for the very illuminating and excellent um, sharing. Uh, let's move on straight to uh, Elisa. Uh, in the meantime, colleagues, you are invited to post your questions and comments in the chat box. Elisa?
Thank you. I'm now going to move on to one of the other countries in this multi-country study, Finland. Uh, my name is Elisa Bruis. I'm from the Department of Education at the University of Oxford, a research associate at CG. So before I move on to just a moment. Before I move on to talking about um, Finland, uh, just like Eileen did, I'm going to outline some key contrasts and differences. Um, higher education policies in North America, the UK, Australia, they emphasize the private goods produced by higher education while under-recognizing the public goods. So how do we see this in higher education policy? Uh, for example, uh, high levels of uh, tuition fees and therefore student loan and therefore student debt. Uh, Lisa Wheelahan and colleagues have written about the fetishization of skills over knowledge. Um, so this is just a Google image of, you know, top 10 uh, soft skills. So we see this trend towards uh, valuing transferable skills more than actual subject knowledge. Um, and Harry Potter is not a, a mistake in there. <laughs> um, I want to make a point about the po uh, political discourse that takes place in this context. So Andrea Jenkins, a conservative um, a member of parliament said at the conservative conference last year, uh, she made a comment uh, about Harry Potter degrees. I'm gonna repeat the, the quote for you here. This is the country, talking about the UK, that gave us the internet, the telephone, the television and the railways. And we didn't do it all by having our brightest and best students standing at seminars and discussing decolonization programs or patriarchy. But she didn't stop there. She went on to say, the current system would rather our young people get a degree in Harry Potter studies than an apprenticeship in construction. Okay. So this uh, takes us back to that um, conversation at this uh, morning session of CG conference day one yesterday. And there was a question, how do we embrace tertiary without talking down or somehow bad mouthing university education? So I will, I'd like to call this the selfie mode of tertiary education policy. Uh, the sole uh, benefit or gain is um, the salary premium that the graduate gets. It's not about the collective benefits. And I'm going to contrast that in the Finnish case, which I will I'd argue has a relational view of tertiary education policy. So students and um, higher education institutions, both polytechnics and universities, are embedded in society and have social purpose. And I'm going to argue there are two things that have contributed to this. Uh, the first is uh, the civistus. Civistus means roughly something like uh, civilization. I'm, I'm going to talk about that a bit more. And the second thing, social policy making approach in general, very different to the economic approach taken in the Anglo-American context. So civistus is um, a philosophical concept, but also has been used by Johanna Wilhelm Snellmann as a pedagogical concept. Uh, it, it means roughly self-formation, for, uh, self-edification or civilization. Um, so Snellmann was deeply depressed by the state of higher education at the time he was writing in the mid 1800s. Um, he said, the university is a school, knowledge is memorization from books, and ethics is a talent for getting ahead in life. So very depressed by the situation of higher education. So in response to this, he wrote his sort of treatise on his vision for civistus as the basis for education uh, uh, on academic studies. And central to this vision was research as learning. So there are parallels there with the Humboldtian university model in Berlin. Uh, also, uh, in addition, he believed that the university had to be an active participant in contemporary scientific battles and important questions to the fatherland, or else it would never receive recognition either from the world of science or from its own citizens. So Snellman links civistus to the cultivation of the mind, but also the cultivation of ethics. And here we see the beginning of this sense of social responsibility. And in the second half of the 1800s, this indeed uh, did uh, happen. The, the one university that existed, the Imperial Alexander University, this is during the pre-independence period under uh, uh, the Russian Empire. Um, the university becomes a site of political organization. The first Finnish language newspaper and other media are published there. And uh, alumni of the university take prominent positions in social, cultural, artistic, and political life. And eventually, a social mobility also takes hold, so you get a more diverse student intake. 
And to this day, the, the student um, movements or student uh, unions are seen uh, as um, explained in the title of this book, the voice of their generation. So this idea of students, universities being involved in important political developments is still there. What was the second thing, apart from this civistist philosophy? Um, I also want to highlight the social policy environment of post-war, uh, so moving now to the independent era, post-war Finland. Um, so public policy in the Nordic countries in general has been heavily influenced by the work of the Swedish economist Gunnar Myrdal, uh, particularly his theory of circular cumulative causation. And drawing on this economic perspective, the Finnish um, uh, academic and policymaker and politician Pekka Kuusi uh, advocated what he called a virtuous circle, not a vicious cycle, but a virtuous circle of um, social equality, democracy and economic growth. So all these things were seen to go hand in hand. Uh, a key challenge at this time in Finland was urban rural inequality. So um, the Finnish state and social policymakers deliberately aim to redistribute educational opportunities more, fa more fairly. So this was a geographically based social engineering. So we can see in the table on the right here, key policies that support this, and that led to the tertiary education system that Finland has today. So from the fifth, 1958 onwards, a new research universities were established across rural provinces. Uh, from the 70s onwards, lots of uh, financial aid packages for students, so government, first in the form of government-based loans, then student benefit, then student housing. Um, public, all the public institutions didn't have fees, and in the 70s, all the private institutions were also nationalized and their fees were abolished, so there are no fees. Uh, and in the 1990s, there's a second wave of expansion by establishing new, uh, almost 20 plus new universities of applied sciences, which are like polytechnics, and again, distributed across the country, not just concentrated in certain cities. So that's a bit of historical background. I've talked about civistus, I've talked about the social policy environment, I've talked about the, the approach being a relational tertiary education policy rather than the selfie mode, right? So I'm now going to share some research findings from the Finland data set. Um, so these are um, uh, interview data conducted with 21 participants, three policymakers, and then a wide range of university staff from two case study institutions, collected in 2019. So firstly, participants did not believe that it was possible to categorize higher education benefits as either a public or a private good. They said they were both. Even the policymakers were, were um, adamant about this. So here's, for example, a policymaker says, from a very simple perspective, what the university produces can be private good, as when I'm educated in a university, I accrue some private good that I can use personally. But when I act in society, for example, through the public sector or maybe providing innovations for healthcare or something like that, they also produce public good. Uh, as a university professor said, education overall produces social cohesion. It integrates people, it gives us generic skills to survive overall. So it's not only something that a certain person gets, it's basically also upholding the society. Okay? So there was a, this is again, what I'm trying to say, like not the selfie view, but the more like relational view of um, education. Uh, participants also framed uh, the, the public good, not using, public good is not a word, uh, we would say in Finnish, it doesn't have a lot of relevance in the Finnish case. Instead, participants chose to frame the public good referring to civistus. So just like Eileen was saying that entre uh, général and the idea of a public service were more salient in France, in Finland, we can see a similar thing uh, with civistus. Um, now I have a paper coming out soon in Kempere where I talk about this in detail. I'm just gonna give you a few quotes as a, to give you a flavor of what they meant by civistus as societal transformation. I think it's very crucial, uh, so this is from a uh, professor. I think it's very crucial that you don't build up a sort of meritocratic elite who are building their authority on expertise in a specific area alone, because you might end up with people who are really narrow-minded and at least in a small society, you need people who are able to understand the whole society, feel affinity to it and think more broadly than just on their own career development. Um, another participant also used, highlighted the issue of language um, being able to um, discuss social science topics in the Finnish language and civistus as maintaining an, a national intellectual life that could protect and buffer Finland rather than passively adopting new uh, streams or new ideas. Uh, one example they gave was neoliberalism and new public management. 
so there are two other um, uh, dimensions to the public good that were very uh, prominent uh, in the interview data, a public engagement. So the idea of the public intellectual, so uh, participants described the way they would um, uh, comment in the um, public news and media, but also directly influencing um, through uh, engaging with policymakers and also the physical spaces that university campuses are were considered, uh, for example, museums they run or the community uh, venues, they were considered publicly accessible places. And social equality was also considered a key feature of the public good mission. And again, it, it wasn't about um, um, social mobility and I go to uni, so therefore I go up in the world and I go up a rank. Um, it was the sense of overall, we all collectively benefit. And it was linked to this idea of uh, citizenship as well. So for example, one uh, professor describes social mobility like this. It's very strongly rooted in the Nordic model that education is a way not only to educate you, but also to provide you with the skills needed in modern urbanized democratic society. So it, it's linked to values again, not just like income. So that sounds like a very positive picture. Maybe we should end there. Maybe we shouldn't, because another important level to the data was the globe, local global tension. And Eileen has already mentioned this, and you're going to spot many similar things happening uh, in, in the next slide, what I explain. So basically, when you talk to the uh, all the professor, university staff, they believe that, that you can have a synergy. They said all these public goods they've described, it's the same. They apply to everyone. They apply to the globe. They apply to all of humanity. And they also highlighted that Finland doesn't produce global public goods, but it receives global public goods. Finland benefits when international students come to study in Finland. Uh, Finland benefits when you know someone in a, in a university outside of Finland produces research, and then they can learn from that, this kind of two-way uh, dialogue. However, recent higher education policy reforms have seriously undermined this. So there are two key um, reforms, uh, introducing international student fees in 2017. The government has sent a minimum, but no cap. So in uh, some of the responses, uh, about a third, they were vehemently against it. Uh, another third, they had this kind of compromise position like Eileen was, was talking about, and a minority actually embraced this. So for example, uh, one uh, university senior manager was talking about recruitment and justifying fees by saying, we are in the market for the best students. So in order to get the best quality, that selective idea of students from around the world, we have to charge fees. Uh, in terms of education export, the government wants Finland to export knowledge uh, by um, attracting in more into fee paying international students, but also through the research consultancy. But there is pushback from the professors who say that's not how knowledge works. Knowledge is about knowledge exchange, and knowledge sharing. I'll give you two examples from education. So you may have heard about the PISA miracle narrative and, and the Finnish education system has been um, promoted around the world as this very, like, you know, this a miracle system. But uh, here is one professor responding to that. We are not trying to sell the Finnish system of education, but I do think that even though we cannot copy other systems, we can learn from other systems and then think what in that system would be something that would benefit us. And then also um, we have a conversation about geopolitics here. So I wanna mention this quote. Um, this is a professor uh, uh, from a history background talking about a research project on the development of democracy in Nordic countries. I would be a little bit careful of not going to preach to some other country that, okay, do exactly as we did in Finland, and then you will begin to be like Finland, because that won't happen. So there's clearly pushback from professors against this um, desire from the government, from policy, to for Finland to be this knowledge expert and, and to uh, attract education export. So that's what I'm trying to show with the flag here. Just like I leave us, there's kind of hybridization going on. There's the creeping encroachment of marketization, which is happening through international policies and is going to is probably going to start happening as well in the national policies. But for the time being, um, the domestic protections that I the solo social policies I mentioned, the no tuition fees and the student financial aid that has been frozen, that continues to exist. I'm going to end there um, because it's time now to hand over to my colleague Christian Shadkovsky, who's going to um, tell us about uh, the same um, uh, project in the case of Poland. Thank, Thank you, you, Elisa. Elisa. Okay. Uh, okay.
Okay, do you see my screen? Uh, thank you very much, Aliza, and thank you for having me. My name is Christian Shutkowski, and I will uh, I will narrate about the case of Poland, which is different as uh, every case uh, uh, collected in our uh, research because uh, it is a case of a post-socialist uh, country with a high uh, distrust towards the state and uh, large level of regrets about uh, the uncontrolled process of marketization. So if we are thinking within the paradigm between the public and the private market and the state, there would be not much left to express Polish specificity. And for this reason, I would like to, I would like to focus your attention on what kind of understanding of this dimension of higher education, the social function of higher education and social uh, articulation of higher education give us the concept of the common good as it was expressed during the interviews collected for this research. So uh, you can see on the slide the map of Poland. We conducted two case studies uh, in two different institutions, collecting 33 interviews, and half of them uh, was done with the ministerial officials and representatives of the collegial institutions. So to understand the Polish system, I would uh, focus your attention on the fact that this is one of the most collegial system uh, in Europe still, where academic faculty has an essential say about uh, how the institutions functions and how this national system function as a whole. And for this reason, for this reason, uh, they uh, uh, manage the system through different organizations embedded at the national level uh, that are run in a very peculiar uh, manner. For this reason, they, uh, the, uh, the, the interviewees see the process, see the process of the past 30 years of uh, capitalist transformation of uh, like moving towards uh, uh, liberal democracy as a process of withdrawal of the state. And with this, what is related is a disappearance of some kind of a sense of the public good role of a state formally state-funded uh, higher education like, like so so as expressed by one of the ministerial officials interviewed for this research the state was withdrawn from the realization of the strategic aims that means also formulating the public good role of the higher education and at the same time was over present and pushed strongly in the areas where it should not be present recent reforms in higher education system in poland was was uh, calculated to get rid of this over-present bureaucratic state and give floor to what is neither market nor uh, nor the state present, but rather like kind of a quasi-marketized uh, academic community in its autonomy, uh, developing the, the, the some kind of a common good role for the society, for science and so on. But uh, in the interview material that we collected, there are like two competing views uh, on the role of the state as a guardian of the public good within the system. On the one side, uh, there is this view that uh, gives the state the uh, active role, uh, steering from a distant and granting full instant, uh, institutional autonomy to institutions. But also, there is a substantially large, large uh, representation of interviewees who, uh, who express the common, uh, common position within the system that the sole function of the state is to merely to provide the public funding for higher, higher education, and the community will do the rest. Uh, so, uh, you can find in the interview material two uh, two general when we asked the interviews like what are the uh, social roles of higher education what do you understand by the public good they either gave the uh, pure economic Samuelson and uh, Samuelson and uh, vision of like higher education as a resource and on the other side it was connected with uh, 
uh, with the political regulatory idea that uh, that uh, stands behind the state that do, does its politics within with regard to higher education. But there was another vision of the public good, which were which was a combination of both, like, like thinking about this uh, provision of resource to higher education as a, uh, as a politically controlled and uh, more or less democratically steered process. Like through this presentation, I will be bombarding you with this uh, uh, abstract images that uh, but because my background is in philosophy and I think true abstract structures and I think this material true abstract structures to the, so in order to give you insights in how people think about the public good and uh, uh, and the common good in higher education I will be pointing out this the, the, this abstractness that can be extracted extracted from uh, from the interview material here you, uh, you have a the short quote about the understanding of this public good as a combination of the both economic and political political uh, dimension. A public good, says ministerial uh, official, is a good that comes or is produced with the participation of the whole or the majority of social resources and processed and redistributed by institution for the good of the whole community. So, so this is more or less a spontaneous definition that was given by the ministry uh, official. I would like to highlight that it's uh, uh, it's quite inclusive, and uh, uh, like I focus in this presentation on the inclusivity of these ideals that are presented in Poland, like uh, the public good and common good, as seen through through the participatory dimension, like uh, in higher education. So is there anything beyond the public good uh, here in Poland? I would say that one of the most important concepts for the, to understand the Polish recent history, post-socialism uh, post and po uh, through post-socialist transformation, is the concept of the common good, which is inscribed in the Polish constitution. Polish constitution starts from the, the statement that Polish Republic, but in Poland is Rzecz Pospolita, which uh, better translate into Latin res communis, something that is common to all. Uh, Polish Republic is the common good of all citizens like the country and the state is something that is like inclusively like managed managed and owned by all the citizens and this concept like has com consequences for how people think about higher education their structure its role for the society and so on so uh there are no clear definition in the polish legal tradition of the uh, concept of the common good but in the uh, transcripts of a national assembly that simply drafted this constitution, we find a definition which is really telling and express also the specificity of, uh, of a Polish approach to the common good. The common good is a sum, sum of the conditions of social life, thanks to which individuals, families and associations can more fully and more easily achieve their own perfection. It is based on the first and foremost respect of natural laws and responsibilities of human person. So you don't have element of a state, state structures, the public sphere in it. You have families, individuals, and associations. And I would say this is all the dimensions that matters for understanding how higher education is conceived, structured, organized, and enacted in, uh, in Polish system. So uh this idea of the common good has its roots as you uh, for sure now like poland is more right now it changed but it's like, like nearly mono-ethnic and mono-religious catholic country for this reason it adds to the conversation about the public good the dimension of uh uh, so, social doctrine of Catholic uh, Catholic philosophy with the uh, and with also a little bit of Aristotelian philosophy to the mix like uh, and uh, some interviewers sees the common good simply as a political idea that uh, that is imposed on the higher education as community uh, and higher education needs to 
stands up to the task of realizing this idea. This, uh, I, uh, like, when you talk with the uh, people in higher education in Poland, when, when we interviewed them, like they use the concept, this frame of the common good, and put different elements into it. Like, like, like our common good is nation, for example. And our common good is science like development of science. And so uh, uh, they all seen themselves as uh, contributors to uh, not development of this idea, but realization through higher education and practices within it. But there was another uh, idea of the common good. Common good as a, as a kind of a horizontal, uh, horizontal community that is self-governed and uh, uh, and communicate and this is this is a strange idea because it's like democratic pores and inclusive like uh, through this concept interviews were talking about bots how they see their institutions as uh, collegially managed how they are inclusive to students to regions like if higher education is a common good everybody can take part in it and shape it and benefit from it as well but uh, they also talked about the through this prism through this concept of the common goods in the re relation with uh, uh, global science I would say uh, researchers with whom we we talked, they were see, uh, seeing the common good role of higher education in Poland as both, as in Finnish case, like benefiting from the common good of science and at the same time contributing and having feeling adept towards the global level to br bring back what they gained uh, from the global dimension uh, as well. There were tensions, but this concept was used uh, to express uh, the same thing. And it also played out perfectly in the recent context of both pandemic and uh, uh, war, uh, 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 Russia-Ukraine war, like uh, recently, because this responsibility toward treating higher education as a common good made people like, uh, for, for, for first and foremost, include others who fl uh, fled, uh, fl fl flew from, from, from the war site. And uh, there were enormous grassroots activities of higher education institutions during that period because they were realizing this organizational conception of the common higher good education as a common good that is inclusive to all. But not everything is uh, just, you know, like pink. There is also a, a corrupted form of the common good, uh, like mentioned in the uh, in, the, in interviews that puts this inclusive common good into danger. I mean that uh, Polish higher education, as it is collegial, is also feudal, like it's based on some hierarchies and this hierarchies of power are used to isolate the higher education from both uh, itself and the society. So this is like a depiction of the corrupted form of a uh, common good, which is in, uh, democratic within it, but isolated from the broader whole. And this was used as a discourse to uh, point at the pathologies of a higher education system in Poland. Uh, so uh, what are the specificities to sum up, because we need to enter some sort of discussion, the specificities of the Polish case. So the concept of the common good either constitutional or that is taken from Catholic social doctrine, help us to better understand the public good and its limits, that there is something beyond and, uh, and uh, also along the public good dimension of higher education. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, so, so the important things to the take home is to know that uh, there are like states, especially in the Central Eastern Europe that have a large historical distrust towards the institution of a state. For this reason, they think about the uh, social roles and social organization of higher education differently. Uh, Polish system is highly collegial. I think that has no much in that, except of maybe Italy. Uh, and 
while the understanding of the public goods uh, in the interviews material matches roughly economic and political definitions of that, there was something something more to the table uh, uh, with the concept of the common good. If you want to read more, the, there is paper in compare on the public goods. There are much more than in this presentation. And there is like one uh, one paper uh, that I written with a colleague that's discussed the common goods and the background in the context of academic freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, to Aline, Elisa, and Christian. Um, I see a few questions coming up in the chat box. Um, while we are waiting for more questions, perhaps um, I'd like to take the privilege as a chair to ask, ask the first question, and then um, I can I will invite John and then David to ask your questions. So my, um, I really enjoyed all of the sharings, particularly uh, giving us very diverse pictures of what's going on in different national cases, although all in Europe. Um, my, my feeling, my sense is that um, each of these cases, you have very different approaches to the public good, which is very um, distinct from the Samuelson or Anglo-American way, uh, economic way of understanding public good. I wonder um, to what extent, while you are looking at these national cases, the, the, the Anglo-American um, concepts is influencing uh, and intermingling with the uh, local and more uh, more local and traditional concepts of the public good. And do you see how the uh, traditional concepts might uh, be more better engaged in the future policy making process um, in interaction with the more dominant neoliberal and also economic discourse of public good? I guess this is the question for all of you. Um, um, feel free to. <laughs> okay, um, just in the case of Finland, yeah, well, th there's been a policy discourse analysis as well. And so the, the traditional public good notion based on Sivistus is actually still there in the policy discourse in the legal documents, both for the University of Applied Sciences and for universities. Um, so what we see is the uh, international higher education policy instead incorporating this new uh, market logic. Um, and uh, what we did, so I think the, um, we can look at public media, newspapers, when the elections were there, that those kind of discourses, um, the national public good based on Civistus in particular, that's still very protected and that case is still made. It's more when we switch to this uh, international um, uh, um, dimension, the relationship between Finland and the outside world. So that's where we, I think uh, universities were not very good at making that case. For example, um, in the election result, there was the the um, Conservative Party and the or the Coalition Party and Kokomus and um, the the far right party, Perussuomala, I said, um, and in the discourse about uh, education-based immigration or work-based immigration, one party, uh, Kokomus, was saying, we need them as many as possible. And, and the government now has a target uh, for the labor market needs. So there was a clear like abandoning of the <laughs> civistis discourse and a wholehearted acceptance of the, the market discourse. Uh, but then um, the uh, right-wing party is um, actually against immigration on a whole, you know, different grounds based on uh, immigration is a threat and we need to protect. So you see the sinister side of having civistis as the basis for a national discourse. And Tuja Pulkinen is a philosopher um, who has written a lot about civistis. And she makes this very point that the way nationalism developed in Finland based on this, not this political judicial system, but this uh, ethnic linguistic based sense of national identity, um, it has a flip side to it. The, the, the positive side is you can have this sustained social consensus and commitment to things like social mobility and social equality. On the flip side of it, it is very homogenous. So how do you deal with any other voices? And so you could say that, you know, and Finland has had in the interwar period as well, there was a far right movement which, which threatened to um, uh, challenge the sort of the social democratic setup that was eventually, that eventually dominated. So th there is a flip side to it as well. Yeah, <laughs> um, I'll allow um, the, my colleagues to, to respond as well. Yeah, no, just qu to quickly echo what uh, Elisa said. Yeah, I mean, it's very similar um, as well in the in the French case. 
in terms of the distinction between uh, a national space um, where the, you know, the idea of the public good can still exist and which can be conditionally extended to the European space. Um, but then, you know, outside of that, there's that bigger space which seem to be where forms of privatization seem to be a bit more acceptable. And it's definitely in the case of uh, France, I don't know how it was in Finland, but I mean, historically in France, it was quite, um, I mean, the idea that, you know, anyone can benefit from it. Also keeping in mind that um, a big chunk of the international students coming to France were from the former colonies as well, which is something that um, the government is trying to actively change as well, namely to kind of change who comes to, to France as an international student and to do what, so that also um, trying to have an impact on that. But I mean, we can really see the same thing where it's really, at, you know, at the, the, the margin that there is possibly a change in the understanding of the public service and the public good as something that is being renationalized in some way um you know prioritized in some way and uh yeah so it's uh i suppose that's what has been happening in other places as well don't know if that answers your very broad uh interesting question lily but from the french case it's very similar to what elisa was describing uh, um, Christian, um, if you if there is no no things that you uh, is there anything that you want to add on top of the to, on top of that? Uh, I uh, I would like to simply uh, show you one uh, picture and uh, to tell you the respond to your question exactly how the local local concepts are like like, like playing out against uh, uh, imposed anglophone discourse or Western discourse about the public and the private, and uh, I would like to shortly briefly sh share a screen with you and show you uh, a picture. This is like a protest uh, pro, pro, pro student protest student and worker work is protest in front of uh, uh, Warsaw University the slogan says the university is a common good the uh, uh, dober of spulne and this is this is simply the one thing uh, one thing that I can quickly find on the internet right now but uh, like, like this is the discourse of a protest against both the discourse of a public and private uh, and uh, the process of reforming towards the more market sides or more efficiency driven side of higher education so 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 uh, I, I would say uh, even if uh, when uh, and this is to respond also to uh, David's uh, question from the chat he asked uh, uh, whether participants might uh, not have thought about the notion common public goods in higher education, I would say, like, uh, I realized that my participant really rarely uh, thought about the public good, but the common good discourse was some sounded for them uh, more or less natural, and they spontaneously uh, used that uh, kinds of, uh, of terms. And discourse of the public-private opposition is more or less specialized expert is driven discourse external to a daily conversations in in Poland like n I think that non-polish citizens uh, citizen would say like something is a public good it's very strange expression because of this distress towards the state of course there is a word like that it's not relevant in the discussion okay that's that's my input Thank you very much for uh, for your uh, excellent and very helpful uh, answers. Um, I'm conscious of time. Let's move on to invite John Anker to uh, to ask your question. John, are you there? Hello. Uh, thanks very much for a very interesting set of presentations. I'll just ask a question towards Elaine, but I see there's another question to the other two speakers. So uh, hopefully everyone will get uh, equal treatment. I just wondered, Eileen, uh, how did the Grande École fit into the picture in France and how does that affect your analysis? 
Yeah, great question. Thank you. Uh, they, they don't really fit. And I mean, you know, that's that's the whole idea of their existence is that they constitute the kind of elite strand. Um, so there's an appearance of, you know, equality and free access, but that does not include them. And they were, uh, I mean, I suppose back in the day, their existence was justified as in terms of, oh, well, you know, we need to create an elite of civil servants. And that's also, you know, for, for the state and for everyone, if, if everyone's good, but that's not what they do really uh, today. And the French system is a very unequal one. So that very selective strand of higher education is also the one that received the most funding, like in terms of, um, I don't have the figures right now, but you know, in terms of how much the state invests in the students who are in that strand, uh, it's a lot more than for those that are in the universities. And uh, yes, obviously it gives a completely different picture when you uh, look at them as part of the system. And interestingly, there's also the kind of technical degrees um, which are outside of universities, um, kind of, you know, semi-vocational courses, shorter courses, and they're also very, very selective. And they're really hard to get into, even for those who want to, uh, um, who would not be, you know, the academic elite, uh, inverted commas. So the university, uh, and it's one of the issues, and I suppose one of the characteristics that justify all those reforms, it has been the place that has been there to kind of absorb the increased number in students and to kind of uphold, if you like, uh, that idea of uh, universal access and, you know, rights to higher education with very restricted means and a uh, huge student dropout issue which has been its way of managing the increased numbers, unfortunately. And this is what some of the reforms are, are trying to, to address, but not without increasing the budget as much as it should, you know, to make it work. So yes, just thank you for bringing that up. I think it's really important to, uh, um, to mention and disrupt that, that image of, you know, perfectly egalitarian system, it definitely is not that. Thank you. Thank you to both Ali and John. Uh, we only have a few minutes left. What I'd like to do is to group all, the, all of the questions and then invite the speakers to respond to them in one go. Uh, for, I, even though David's question has been uh, slightly touched upon by uh, Christian, but I feel it's a really important question. So I will invite David, Simon, and then Hira to ask your questions. David. Thank you all. I mean, thank you, Lily. I mean, great set of presentations. My question really, which Christian began to answer, was with really a methodological one almost about your role, because all three of you are having to sort of nuance and broker this 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 gap between um an Anglophone discourse around the public um and all the resonances that public private now have in a private political way. So I thought, Christian, your response about the actually common was a far more sort of grounding and meaningful concept was very helpful and I think perhaps Eliza or Aline might want to comment on on how you might translate the common into Finnish or French. Thanks. Thank you David. Simon I'd like to invite you. I thought that was really good presentations today and um, I mean what they showed us is that there's this robust traditions of commonness and publicness and um, and they're different, you know, they're nation and culturally specific and uh, language specific. And, you know, that's, it's really important to, 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 you know, to be able to think outside the, the Anglophone public good box and which is dominant in the literature on higher education and to put ourselves into these other frameworks and, and think things out from there, looking out from those countries. But of course, there's also the question of what's common across countries and what's different. And, um, and that takes us to the question, the very difficult question, I think, of the nature of the global common good, which we talk about rhetorically quite a lot, but we don't have any clear, really clear idea yet what it is uh, that we would like to pursue here. And yet it's so important because of ecology and other broader, you know, shared problems. So, I mean, it seems to me that there's 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 two possibilities to to work out what the global, global common good could be. I mean, one is that you have a kind of multilateral UN style nations all getting together multilateral negotiation and you try and arrive at some common approach. Now, 
the way that's worked in the past is in these big international organizations is that the dominant countries have set the framework uh, and the UN system, of course, it was the United States primarily that framed it, although there was really interesting discussions about broadening the approach in the, you know, the foundation stages um, and some quite important things were done there. And the UN Declaration of, of Human Rights probably went quite a long way to embrace some of the diversity, but it, in the end, it was a sort of Western liberal notion, wasn't it? So, um, um, you know, there is that sort of multilateral process, but the problem with the multilateral process is that any major player can can veto the whole process, can essentially, you know, block the consensus from forming by saying we don't agree, and that's that didn't happen in the UN system because the US was dominant and because the certain countries had won the war and so on and were able to set the terms. Um, but it, at at this point, with a with a much more plural environment, you know, in a multilateral process, anyone can kind of stop a common definition from emerging. So. And you can imagine how that would play out. So, I mean, multilateralism is a problem. So you need then another concept which you can advance in all countries, if you like. Um, well, the other alternative, of course, was the free trade idea, the World Trade Organization, the notion of a global market. And that, of course, has got all the downsides we're also very well aware of. And it's quite disturbing to see that still that kind of Anglophone free trade neoliberal marketization agenda is still finding its way into Finland, which has been such a strong system and France, which has got such a strong tradition and so on. So, I mean, that, I mean, the, the, you know, a, a sort of ec economically driven idea of commonality is in a capitalist world is going to be a capitalist idea of commonality. And that's going to have all the downsides that we're all aware of, including the ecological ones. So what's the alternative? You know, what, what's the third concept that we can develop? You know, is it based on epistemic justice and shared educational values? You know, is it the Chinese idea of Chan Xia, which we've talked about in some other forums? You know, what 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 are the ideas which we can bring forward to create a sense of global commonality? Thank you, Simon. Um, Hera, do you want to come in and ask your question? Are you there, Hera? Yes. Hi. Thanks, Lily. Um, Thank you, Christian, Alyssa, and Aline for your presentations. Um, I come from an architectural perspective to, to the topic. And um, although museums and other sort of spaces are indeed uh, open to public, um, we now often see like a barrier put at the entrances of various university buildings for swipe card entries. And I can understand the reasons of safety, fire safety, security. Apart from museums uh, and to a certain extent libraries, which are the other spaces that you have found um, or other practices where you have found uh, where universities are sharing their uh, estates with public in a more sort of integrated manner? Thank you, Hera. Um, now I will invite all of those three speakers to quickly respond to all of these three questions. <laughs> Okay, I may start quickly, uh, like too much on the table. To David, I already expressed what, what my case can bring. Uh, to Simon, I would say, yes, I would echo uh, the uh, option which, uh, with that global entity that would uh, stand for uh, the global common good. But uh, as all of these concepts, they have uh, a quasi uh, universal nature and uh, they always are expression of specific configuration of material interests. So, so, so the common and the common good is a concept from the order of communism, not this historical one, but uh, yeah, you cannot have a com global common good without communism. Uh, uh, so, so that's my answer. And for the for the architectural uh, uh, question, I think it's like superbly important. And also, uh, I had a lot of discussions about that in Poland. What can be improved? They are like uh, Polish universities are like in principle open. Like, like uh, everybody can walk in. Everybody can uh, even uh, uh, enter 
lectures uh, without any fees, without control, except of some secret labs or uh, the, the, like really lab spaces uh, in biology. Everybody can use university facilities. They have open air like uh, fitness places to use for by citizens. They organize concerts in their neighborhoods uh, and they are not very well campusized i would say like they are architecturally spread all over the cities there were no wave of 68 protests like may 68 protests like in the west that uh put campuses outside the cities for this reason they are still in and they serve their communities uh yeah and they don't even charge for example for the halls like, like, like you can organize an event at the university without a fee uh, in most of the respects Thank you, Christian. Um, Elisa, do you want to go next? Um, yeah, it, it, that's a massive question from Simon. I mean, that's a, a question that we're trying to answer on this project collectively in a common way. <laughs> of course, the one thing we should have uh, mentioned in our presentation is probably the UNESCO reframing of uh, higher education as a common good report. And the important work Rita Locatelli has, has, has worked on this. Um, it's definitely one... Um, you know, concept want to engage with, and also Lily, <laughs> who's chairing this session, will probably want to uh, tell us about uh, Tianxia Weigong, which is uh, all under heaven for all. So obviously, um, you know, this is a massive question that we're not going to answer in like the next 60, <laughs> 60 seconds, but I'm glad you raised it. Um, I think I want to link it back to other themes from the conference is uh, it comes back down to the community and us. So there is that uh, theme of accountability we've heard of, um, the uh, uh, um the 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 um continuous tension between autonomy and control right but we do have you know what agency do we have and how do we use that and alice you know made a powerful case for this uh, generative accountability in her keynote yesterday so and i think in the next keynote coming up rebecca is going to talk about the um uh, a similar theme of accountability as well the echo chamber effect and research at why do we you know we, we it is also in our hands um, <laughs> to enact some of the change that we want to see. And um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, in terms of the public spaces, one final thing. Yeah, I echo uh, pretty much everything Christian has said. And just a funny anecdote to that. Uh, the Finnish libraries are the only, like, uh, only places I have seen mums pushing buggies while choosing books, <laughs> you know? So physically they are so accessible and free and you do not need to subscribe and have a membership. And the, the, just like Christian said, the buildings are, uh, you don't have barricades you have to go through that they, they are accessible. And they do lots of outreach work with high schools as well, summer schools, uh, public education, yeah. Okay, I'll end there. Thank you, Elisa, Aline. Yeah, so uh, very quickly about, yes, the idea of the common good, bien commun, that came up in interviews, uh, not as much as uh, public interest and public service. And I think like the idea of the, 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 the common good would be used a lot in debates over things like uh, the right to water or culture or, you know, like um, arts and this kind of, of material or immaterial resources. But it's true that in our interviews, it did come up, but not as frequently, maybe maybe because the idea of the public service um, is more important, perhaps because of the fact that, you know, it's education and research are delivered by, you know, public servants. So maybe the, the people doing it are more central. I don't know, just just uh, an idea to, um, to explore, perhaps. Uh, Simon's broader question I can only, you know, ask the question again and i do wonder you know under the present conditions of global capitalism and racial capitalism how is it possible and uh, we can only you know um continue those conversations to uh to find out how we can achieve some progress in that direction and for hiraz brilliant question i i I was actually trying to think and remember when I did the field work and on other occasions what it was like to be on those campuses and on some of them, I remember the one in Toulouse, you can access the university library without anybody asking you what you're doing there, that, you know, like a public library, actually even more open than a public library and the building is right in the middle of town. But when I did the field work in, in other places and in fact when I taught in the Sorbonne in Paris, I, I couldn't get in because you had security guards 
And then I had to leave my passport at the entrance as evidence that I was not going to run away with some equipment, even though I was teaching them. <laughs> so it's a really interesting question. And I think it would be great to do uh, an analysis of how the space is used and how enclosed it is across campuses. So thank you for that. Thank you, Aline. I'd like to thank everyone again for staying with us, uh, even though we are running a bit over time. And uh, I will, I'd like to remind you that we will have a keynote um, in the afternoon uh, in, from 1.30 UK time. And see you there. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.